All right, everyone, so hopefully you all had a very Merry Christmas and welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all well. I am doing fantastic in tier four and loving life, but I hope you all had a Merry Christmas and um, yeah, many wishes for the new year. But today, anyway, we're back to another MMI video and last video we spoke about body language and um, how to conduct yourself. Hopefully it's very useful. A lot of people don't think about those things, which is why they don't do so well in an interview. So if you want to watch that, um, I'll put it on the screen here. I will be waiting for you so you can leave this video now and just watch that very quickly and come back and yeah go and watch that now right so if you're still here um, I'm assuming you've already watched the video which is fantastic um, so today obviously as you can see from my screen we are talking about the NHS our lovely beloved NHS um, which we all love dearly and it's free and it's wonderful and it's not America and it's brilliant so Today we are talking about how to talk about the NHS in interview. Now it's a very common topic and it's pretty much certain to come up. If I was a betting man, I would put my money on the NHS coming up because you know it is the most basic topic to come up. You, it's your future employer. It's basically funding your education. It's doing everything for you. So it will come up in interview. And if you don't know about anything about it, um, it's fair to say you probably won't get into medical university. Um, but yeah. Hopefully you know what the NHS is. If you haven't heard about the NHS, I would recommend uh, lifting up the rock you've been living under for the last 10 years, picking up a newspaper and reading it. It is basically our national healthcare system and it is basically what gives us healthcare in this country. It is free, technically. I wouldn't say that because it's not free. You do pay for the NHS, or rather your parents do, if they pay tax. Um, they also are funded through insurance and a variety of other donations and small financial things. But the main you know, method through which they're funded is our taxes. Uh, the NHS is very important. Its history is very simple to learn. 1946 created by Annie and Bevan of the Labour Party, who was their variant of uh, Matt Hancock, basically, the health minister. and. It is created in order to give healthcare uh, free at the point of use, to be funded by general taxation, and um, to be available to everyone. So, you know, it doesn't matter what sexual orientation you are, it doesn't matter if you're employed or not, it doesn't matter if you're a man or woman or child, you all have access to the NHS, which is a wonderful thing. And, you know, at its very core, healthcare is a human right, so it's only right that, you know, this is given to everyone. It's absolutely everyone um what do you need to know factually well not too much you should know the seven found the seven core principles of the nhs um the seven c's of the nhs or five c's you know even i forgot on this but you know i'll link them all in the description below i'll put them on the screen now but you know they're very simple things to learn you literally just need to memorize them they're not too difficult as well as that you the other thing you should learn is the structure of the nhs which is very important the nhs is structured um quite complexly it was very simple back in the day when we had just had it and it was basically a baby and it was going into its toddler years. You know, we had primary care, the government and pretty much anything else to do with healthcare in another box. But now obviously those things don't work anymore because you know, the longer you have the NHS, the more problems it runs into, which means the more effective funding needs to be. So now it's tiered into several groups, including um, the Department of Health, Primary, Secondary and Tertiary Care, um, NICE and a variety of other groups. Now I'm not going to list all of them off now because that's going to take time on the video. Instead I will put them all in the link below um, on a website that Medic Portal uses. But I will go through a couple of the important ones um, or rather three of the important ones. Primary, secondary and tertiary care. They are what you need to know and you must know these things. Primary care is um, basically somewhere you've probably done work experience from, a GP surgery or a clinic. As well as that, uh, retirement homes are considered uh, primary care. They are basically the primary source of healthcare. So if, for example, you wake up one day and you've got pain in your cheek and it's not going away, you're gonna ring probably your GP surgery first. That's why it's primary care. It's your first port of call for um, healthcare. Secondary care is what happens next. So if it's worse pain and you're at the GP surgery, your GP will most likely refer you to A&E or to a hospital. And that is why it's called secondary care. It's basically A&E, um, outpatient clinics, um, inpatient clinics, all of those things that you hear about where you've also probably done work experience and where you should do experience, that is secondary care. Tertiary care is less common and a lot of people don't know about tertiary care, but it's very important. It is basically a specialist, um, a cardiologist, a urologist, someone who knows what they're doing, a specialist clinic. So if you've got an even more, you know, deeper problem, for example, if you've got a very specific type of cancer or if you've got a very specific type of cardiovascular disease, you will be probably referred to a specialist who will help you and help try and treat you. 
So those are the three things you'd need to know about. Um, and that's everything really in terms of what you need to know about the NHS factually. Um, I wouldn't recommend learning too much about it, you know, memorising it, because that's not what you need to know. What you need to do is analyse it critically. Um, they will probably ask you not to recite the history of the NHS, but instead to talk about the problems the NHS faces now, because that's what's going to be relevant to you. So what they want you to do is to talk about the problems of the NHS and give a solution, which is what the government have been trying to do for the last 10 years. So what your role is, is to talk about a problem. So let's pick a problem. There are quite a few problems the NHS has currently, for example, the growing population, an ageing population, the rise of private healthcare, uh, research and development funding, and also probably communication in the NHS. You know, the most important problem we have now is our ageing population. Now, while that may seem like a good thing, you know, healthcare is working, we're living longer, it gives rise to a host of new problems which we have not encountered before. Alzheimer's disease, dementia, Parkinson's, all of these neurodegenerative diseases which are affecting a, you know, a huge amount of our population, a huge number of our citizens in the UK. Now, the problem is that we don't have a treatment or effective cure for these diseases, which means it's all about preventing or dealing with the disease. Now, it means that people, um, elderly people, stay in hospital for longer, take up bed spaces, which reduces bed spaces for urgent patients, you know, people who have emergencies such as cancer patients, patients in A&E, which then builds up A&E waiting times, which then means that people have less access to hospitals, which means that they wait for longer time, which means they get angry, which means they start abusing the NHS, and you, you can see how many problems this causes. So, you know, it's all about trying to adapt the NHS to this new sort of phase of neurodegenerative diseases for this particular problem. So what could you have a solution? Well, you could talk about social care, which is a thing that interviewers love to hear about and gets you marks instantly because it's a very complex thing and people don't consider it as part of the NHS. You could talk about using social care like retirement homes as a place to send patients, elderly patients who have been treated for the dementia and you know sending them there for long-term recovery instead of keeping them in hospitals freeing up bed spaces making more space for cancer patients emergency patients and you know that's the answer in itself but make sure you're weighing this problem up against a solution that you've come up on your own and yeah you could come up with this at home you can rehearse this because you know what there's no point in trying to come up with this inter interview it's quite a hard question they'll have expected you to do some research as part of it you can probably go through this question so hopefully that was helpful and that's everything pretty much I can think of about the NHS. There's not too much more. Um, unless you guys have got anything else to say, drop them in the comments below. I am going to go over a quick mock question with you guys and an answer. So hopefully I'll give the mock question and then you guys can go through what you would think a good answer is and then I'll run the rubric answer myself. Um, make sure you're thinking about everything, not just this video, but everything which makes a good medical interview answer. And yeah, we'll go through it in a bit. Awesome. All right, so the medical interview question is, or the MMI question is, um, how would you adapt the NHS to the 21st century? Give an answer using examples of problems that you've heard of in the news and potentially anything else that you'd like to bring up in this answer. Awesome, so have a go at this. Um, you should probably think for about, you know, 10 to 15 seconds and then ta start talking for about 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Record your answer if you can or tell it to a parent and then come back and watch the answer that I give you. So we'll pause the video now and give you about a minute to do all that. Awesome, so it's been a minute. Hopefully you've thought of your answer and you've given it. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, if this is your first time preparing for an interview, it doesn't have to be perfect. If you're preparing for an interview next week, you should probably have a very strong answer. You should have heard of this question many times before. But um, yeah, so I'm gonna go through the answer now. So I've decided to pick um, 
the Alzheimer's problem and you know the aging population because it's suitable for the 21st century you know we have a lot more people with Alzheimer's and dementia these days and my answer is as follows so the NHS has a lot of problems dealing with our aging population and that basically means that it has problems dealing with dementia Alzheimer's and patients with neurodegenerative diseases the problem is that these patients tend to take up bed spaces in a term known as bed blocking. Um, it means that patients who desperately need hospital treatment and um, care by physicians are unable to access these things and are often left in A&E, which also has the effect of increasing waiting times. This is a long-term problem and needs an urgent solution. What I would do is I would implement uh, social care as a more structured part of the NHS. So I would recommend that patients with Alzheimer's or dementia, once they've reached a particular point in their treatment plan, or once they've completed a checklist of treatment at hospital, are immediately sent off to a local or to a social care facility. So for example, a retirement home, or are often offered a social care worker to visit them at their residency, whether it's at their house or whether it's living with family. And so in this way, they can carry out the rest of their treatment, which isn't needed to be at hospital whatsoever, with someone who knows exactly what they need, and with someone who can keep in contact with their GP. And so if any problems arise, they can then contact a medical physician, such as a GP, but they don't need to wait it out in hospital. They can free up these bed spaces so that people such as cancer patients or people in A&E can access these bed spaces who need them a lot more urgently. All right, so that was my answer. Um, as you can see, I covered everything. Um, so I first of all spoke about the problem and explained it very briefly. You know, dementia, brought in some of my biological knowledge, neurodegenerative diseases, examples of dementia. I then spent most of the time actually talking about the solution and debating it. So I spoke about social care, what it is, why it's helpful. Um, I spoke about the options that are available. So I've taken into account that some people or some patients may not want to go to retirement homes. So they could instead be given a social care worker to go to their homes or um, to their family's homes so that they have a port of access. And yeah, I gave a conclusion. Um, which was about 10 seconds long and just said, you know, this is hopefully something that can be used in the future as it cuts back on funding resources and bed blocking and, you know, solves a variety of problems. How could I improve my answer? Well, there are a few things that I could have done. One of the main things that you should have caught out on that I didn't do was refer to my work experience. So if you've done work experience at a retirement home, you should definitely bring that into an answer about the NHS. You should say that I've worked at a retirement home as a volunteer and I've seen that you know they do great work there and it would be really important to the NHS that they use these facilities that are there you know, to supplement their treatment of elderly patients. What else could you do? Well, you would talk about the negatives. I failed to speak about negatives when I gave my solution. There are obviously going to be problems that it's difficult practicality. Um, it's not easy at all to just, you know, build a relationship between a hospital and a retirement home because, you know, there are so many retirement homes, there are so many patients. Um, how do you decide which patients go to which retirement home? How do you make sure retirement homes aren't overflowing? And um, how do you keep up the quality of care in retirement homes without, you know, overflowing them with patients? There are loads of problems with this um, solution and I didn't raise any of them. So I would say to do that definitely. But yeah, that's all I would really say. Um, there's nothing else that you need to um, talk about. You want to keep it to a minute. So I would Im just, you know, bring in the work experience for a sentence maybe, and also bring in the negatives for about 10 seconds, one sentence or something like that. Not too much. And yeah, the interviewer would be very impressed I'd seen with that answer if you brought in some of the things that I missed out. But yeah, hopefully that was a very helpful um, video for you guys. If you've got any questions, please do just drop them in the comments below. Um, please do um, DM me on Instagram, follow me on Instagram as well for um, any more things. I'll be announcing video releases and notes as well. So this is my Notion, um, which is Notion is a application very useful. I'm going to do a video on it soon. It's basically an incredible note taking app. If you haven't used it for your school learning, I would highly recommend it. It's brilliant. Um, but I will be releasing my Notion notes um, soon on my Instagram for medical preparation. So please do follow that if you want access to those. And subscribe, please do subscribe. Um, it helps me make more videos. So yeah, just smash the subscribe button and the like button. And if you want any more particular videos about MMIs, just drop them in the comments below as well. But yeah, hope you guys have a great day um, and best of luck for your preparation and see you in the next video. Peace.